The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. Uh, this is the Geek Empowerment Talk. And uh, we'll start with the obligatory who the heck is the geek up front. Uh, basically, I've been around the block for a long time. Uh, been using Linux since 95, became my desktop system in 97. How many people remember FVWM 95? Yeah. One of those good things that, you know, you, you kind of hope it's tucked away inside one of those brain cells that dies as you get older, you know. But um, I used to give a lot of talks about open source advocacy in the early days, back in the late 90s, the early aughts. We have a real good name for that decade. I mean, aughts. I don't know. Um, I uh, then went on to, you know, to work as a columnist and uh, worked on the Linux show webcast. How many people remember the Linux show? God, I feel old. Oh, and um, uh, I wrote a book which was on Slashdot and all the copies that were ever sold were sold within four days and then everyone forgot about the book, which is about usual. Um, and currently I'm evangelist for Zen Project, and I've got a Zen talk later on after lunch uh, for those of you who actually decide to, to hang around. Um, thank you for coming out on a Sunday morning. This talk actually comes out of some reflection on personal experience. So as I said, I, I started off working inside the open source world back in the 90s. I then, like a lot of people, ended up uh, working for a company that was consuming open source, but not producing it, despite the fact that we tried to get them to produce some. That then was uh, consumed by a company that was allergic to open source. So I spent some time in the bowels of hell, uh, you know. And then uh, just uh, a year and a half ago, I actually got to break free and get back into the community as an open source evangelist. And when, when I did so, I noticed that certain things had changed, and that's basically where this talk has come from. So a little reflection, you know, open source is driving the world. The internet breathes open source air. If you don't believe me, just look at the number of web servers that are running Apache, look at the number of LAMP stacks out there. You know, it is just stupendous. Uh, I think what a lot of people don't really realize is that open source, I think, was a great beneficiary of the whole Y2K nonsense. How many people had to wrestle with the Y2K stuff on the job? You know, one of the things that I remember so distinctly, I, uh, I live in the Washington, D.C. area, so I've had a number of government customers over the years. And the amount of money that was thrown at trying to keep boat anchors from dying on January 1st, 2000, was absolutely astounding. Uh, and I can actually tell you some stories that would curl your hair later. But, um, but one of the interesting things that I saw was that all the budget was going towards the Y2K stuff. So you had this new technology coming on, the web, that everyone was saying, yeah, yeah, we got to do stuff about that. But there was no budget for it, because they were all trying to make sure that the boat anchors wouldn't die. And so system administrators, being the resourceful lot that they are, went out and find, found useful software that fit within the non-existent budget. And hence, you saw open source coming in uh, heavily on the web uh, for corporations. And that was also part of that wonderful time when the sysadmin at big company, uh, who you had lunch with yesterday, was talking about all the Apache servers he was running. And then the CEO of big company was just uh, quoted in Forbes as saying, we will never use open source in our organization. There was that immense disconnect because what was happening on the level of reality was not being dictated from above, it was crawling up from below. And so there was this disconnect. And that's the way we really started. If you think back to the 1990s, how many people were working in the open source world sometime in the 1990s? Just show of hands. 
Okay, so, so this is history for some, this might be new for others. And it's important to know, believe me. We were constantly ignored by analysts. Where do analysts work? They work on the sea levels, right? They're talking to the CEOs, they're trying to see what the big picture is, they're trying to see what's coming down the road. Well, the sea levels at that point, as I just said, were being disconnected from what the sysadmins are doing. And so the, the sea levels were saying, oh yes, we're gonna be using Microsoft, we're gonna be using this thing, we're gonna be using Solaris. We're... And the, meanwhile, the admins were, were pushing out miles and miles of lamp stacks because that's what they had to work with. In the press and in management levels, you know, open source is dismissed as a hacker's toy. You know, teenagers working in their basements writing this software. Oh, you know, this is just, this is not professional, this is not what, what the enterprise needs, blah, 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 blah. It was almost a 100% voluntary effort back then, which may be a little bit hard to believe right now, but it was true. Everything was running on passion. Things were moving very quickly. And, you know, amongst us, we knew what was going on because we'd come to little meetings like this on weekends and so forth and talk to one another and we could see it. But at the top levels, management levels, analyst levels, no visibility at all. So it was a different world back then. Today, however, we've got legitimacy. You know, the trade media reports on us, how many articles you see in major magazines that talk about using open source stuff. Sea level management still may not be particularly clueful about what open source is or does, but they get the idea that they're going to use it for some things and that it has some form of value. One of the repeated uh, themes I'm hearing recently is using open source as a model for collaborative development, even in non-open source areas. So there is this concept that there is something of value going on here, even by the people who may not really understand it. How many people right now in this room have a job where you write, use, or otherwise employ open source as part of the job description? Just show of hands, please. Yeah, that's, that's about what I figure, and that's amazing compared to where we were 15 years ago. Absolutely amazing. So we are in this area where open source employment is not difficult to find. It's not unusual. It's out there. So all's good, right? We won. We got the legitimacy. We got the jobs. We got respect. We got everything. Or did we? There is something that has changed. And one of, the, one of the lessons that I suggest we are not talking about, I'm not hearing it discussed in the community, and that's why I'm giving this talk, is that the heart of open source, we talk about the results of open source, the code, and that's wonderful, because the code empowers others. It empowers the startup, it empowers the mom and pop organization, it empowers uh, the teenager who wants to be able to do things. All these people are being empowered, third world countries, wonderful. But a, there's a piece that we're forgetting as well, that the empowerment also happened to us. And that the real revolution, I suggest, with the coming of open source, had to do with us changing and then the way we changed, then changed the way we dealt with others and what our output was. So we reinvented us when we came along with the open source revolution. And by open source, I'm saying free slash open source. I don't want to get into the free software open source debate at this point, but if you're in that camp, that's what I'm talking about. Unfortunately, the lesson of the revolution in us is being forgotten. And this is especially true, I suggest, for some of us who weren't around at the beginning. Let's think back. People with gray hair in your temples. Think of IT land circa 1985. What was life like? If you were a techie, you were a geek, 
You were a power tool. You had skills, you had knowledge, and you sit down, you shut up, and you did what someone else told you to do. That was life for the computer geek. You really didn't have much of a self-will, a self-determination. There certainly wasn't anyone listening to you. You were lucky if you get your boss to listen to you, let alone anyone else. You have all this talent, but yet you are being directed in what you will do. Day after day, moment by moment, you get some idea of some really great feature for the software you're working on. You go to whomever and say, this would be cool. And they say, well, that, that may be, but it's not inside the uh, work plan, so uh, get back to work and do what we tell you to do. That really was part and parcel of life for the, for the geek 20, 30 years ago. You didn't have much respect. You didn't have much bargaining power. You didn't hear about people, uh, technical people, who had to bargain for a better salary. There wasn't anything to bargain for. You took what they gave you. That was pretty much it. Because after all, you were just a geek. But with open source, with the free software movement, there was a change that happened in our own minds. And it comes about, and how many people remember the Atlanta Linux Showcase? Anyone? Yes. Yes, brother. <laughs> ALS, the first, the first uh, free and open source event that I ever went to was the 1997 Atlanta Linux Showcase. 500 geeks, mostly of the fat white male variety, meeting on a weekend in Atlanta to talk about open source. You know, I think we may have lost a little weight. We've added a few more women, but not nearly enough. And our ethnic diversity is good if you look at India and Asia, but for somehow we're forgetting about people of color in this continent. I don't know why. That's another problem. But it was a get together. You know, no one was there being paid by their company, they just wanted to go. It was a cheap hotel. I don't remember what the hotel was, but the thing I remember about the hotel was the most appropriate hotel in the world because its restaurant was a Wendy's. And this is, for, for, for younger people, this was Wendy's before it started to suck, you know? So I mean, you had like all the fat, all the caffeine, all the sugar, all the grease, all the fuel that a geek needs for cheap for a weekend to talk about code. So I mean, it was wonderfully appropriate. And you would go and you would talk at these, you know, talk to people in sessions like this, and you'd see the fire in people's eyes, the fire in the bellies. People were excited. It was amazing. It truly was amazing. And it wasn't some sort of amazement at some new commercial collaborative engagement. No, that wasn't it at all. And it, it wasn't even about the four freedoms. Now, are the four freedoms uh, you know, important? Absolutely. Absolutely, they're important. But that's not what, what people were getting ziggy about. They were using the freedoms of free software, but it was a little bit more than that. And it certainly wasn't about employment. Because if I had asked this question at that session back then, I would have been lucky to have seen a hand. Because no one, no one was doing anything professionally in open source. And those that were, you know, were probably working with little mom and pop companies that you didn't know if you were going to have a job next month, quite honestly. That's pretty much the way things were. But what was coming about was a self-realization and an empowerment that the technical world had never seen before. <coughs> People realized that there was no one in the room to say no. And this was different. People had ideas. We could talk to each other. We could say, you know what? I want to do blah. And for the first time, you could go ahead and do it, and you survived or failed according to your own merits. You could just do it. There wasn't anyone to stop you. Just do it. You weren't the power tool of someone else. 
You made decisions. How many people know Dilbert, first off? Good. Now, how many people remember Mordak the Preventer? Okay. Homework assignment, before you leave the conference, if you have using usable Wi-Fi, just Google Mordak the Preventer, okay? This is important <laughs> because this is the old style mindset of IT. Mordak was the guy who used to come around and tell them that they couldn't have or couldn't do the things that they needed to do to get their job done. That was his job. Paraphrasing a strip, you know, Mordak comes up to Dilbert and says, those servers you ordered, they're not on the approved list. You can't have them. And Dilbert says something like, approved list? What approved list? I've never seen an approved list. You show me the approved list. I don't even think it exists. And Mordak sort of sits back and says, you know, it's not really a list. It's more a state of mind. And that really was it. It was that control thing that told you, no, 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 you do what, you do what we say, and that's all you do. And suddenly, that's turned on its head. Suddenly, geeks are making decisions. They're deciding for themselves what's good and what's not. They're deciding for themselves what designs make sense and what don't. They're experimenting. They're trying things. And what's more, this is where we sort of found our voice individually and as a community. And I remember Miguel de Casa. How many people know who Miguel is? How many people know what the GNOME project is? OK. Long ago and far away, Miguel was the head of a little bitty project that was just beginning called GNOME. And GNOME was getting hot. And this was somewhere. I think it was around like 1998 at the Linux Expo, and I don't mean the Linux World Conference and Expo, I mean Linux Expo, which was in the Raleigh-Durham area, sort of Red Hat's backyard. Miguel had a talk on GNOME, and he had the big theater, you know? He had the one with the, with the seats that went up and all this sort of stuff. People were packed, people were standing against the walls waiting to hear because GNOME was hot. He wanted to see what was coming in GNOME. And Miguel got up there, and as I understand it, he had a laptop that was designed for the Mexican market. And I don't know whether that specifically had to do with the problem, but whatever it was, that lap laptop refused to sync with the projector. So there were no slides. What's more, his slides, like most of the people here, his slides were his notes. So not only were there no slides, there were no notes. A room full of people, expectantly waiting. A geek with no formal, you know, management training, how to present, blah, blah, blah. And quite honestly, I don't know if he would have probably felt more, uh, more at home doing it in Spanish than English, although he's quite, you know, fluent in both. But you know, so I mean, he's got all these things working against him. And he stood there, and he talked for an hour. And he was funny, and he was interesting, he was informative, and at the end he got a standing ovation. And he didn't get a standing ovation out of pity or sympathy. He got a standing ovation because he aced it. Here's a geek who speaks who thinks, who presents, and who makes people excited. This was different. How many people know that British uh, comedy IT crowd? Oh, cool. That was the image of the, of the geek. The guys, you know, for people who haven't seen it, the guys locked in the basement who no one ever saw, who just sat there and played with their little machinery and basically had a hard time interacting with other human beings. That was, that was supposed to be our lives. And instead, people are standing up, they're talking, and they're doing the things that only management was supposed to do, only the business people were supposed to do. And we were doing it, and we were, we were acing it. And I, you know, I think, too, how many 
professionally trained management people I know who would have crumpled up like a paper ball faced with that same situation. But he didn't. He excelled because he spoke from the heart. So, in the early free and open source movement, the code was incredibly important. It's the output. It's the thing that enabled others. The four freedoms, highly important. It's the enabler. But the people were the story. It was us that was changing. We learned to think for ourselves, to speak for ourselves. We even learned to write for ourselves. And suddenly, we became empowered. You know, for me, I, I work for a little company called Digital Equipment Corporation. How many people remember Digital Equipment Corporation? And I had one of those employment contracts that said, the dreams that occur to me on my pillow at night belong to the company. That's the way the IP stuff was, was worded. So I couldn't, I couldn't code in the open source world because that belonged to the company. But they had this little thing there that they said thought, thought leadership is good. So if you publish, if you write, if you speak, we'll give you applause for that, even a little bit of an incentive. So it's like, okay, well, you're not going to let me code. I'll start shooting off my mouth. And that's how I started writing in the open source world. I've never been trained as a writer. And then later when Compaq ate digital and I got stuck in one of the post takeover layoffs, I'm at home trying to figure out what to do next, and I get contacted by the publisher of InfoWorld magazine, who said, we just lost our open source columnist. I've read your work. Would you like to work for us? And so that started a couple of years of me writing professionally, which was the weirdest thing, because that was not on my radar. But because I took the step that was available to me, my world changed. And there were a lot of us who ended up doing that sort of thing. And it also began economic power. Remember, as I said, in the, you know, the early days professionally, you, know, you, you got your salary, you were lucky, you had a job, blah, 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 blah. You know, if, if you remember, if you're old enough to remember back then, well, it's a good thing you have a job, that's all. You know, and uh, you didn't have much power. It was around the same time that, um, just before the dot-com era turned into the dot-bomb era, uh, I remember working at DEC, and they needed a couple very particular uh, networking people, very particular skill sets. And uh, the, the, I was talking with a manager who said, yeah, well, I, I found these two guys. They're open source guys. They got the skills I need. But I went and talked with them, and they said, yeah, we'll work for you. We want $150,000 each. Now, this is 15 years ago, and that was probably about twice what that manager was thinking of trying to offer. It's like, what? So, I mean, the manager was like floored. Like, are you kidding me? You know, $150,000, are you kidding me? So he went away, he tried to find other candidates, couldn't find other candidates, not as good as these fellas. So he said, well, I'm going to go back and I'm going to talk, see if I can talk him down a bit, maybe. So he goes back to the guys a couple of weeks later and said, no thanks, we already found jobs. This didn't happen. No one bid for our services before. We weren't something to be desired. We were simply something to be hired. This was a different world. Now back in the late 90s, the thing of the open source job was the brass ring. You know, it was the grand goal. And it was, you know, it was more a dream than a goal. Because I'm, I can remember talking to, you know, one guy at one of these early conferences, and he's saying, man, it'd be so cool. Oh, it'd be so cool if we could get paid to do this. Man, that'd be so cool. And it wasn't so much the business sort of goal as it is the dream that you know, the 13-year-old has of you know, marrying the supermodel is one of those things that ain't going to happen, but it doesn't keep you from thinking about it. That's kind of where the whole notion of an open source job was back then. It was fiction, but you like thinking about the fiction. And that's really what it was. And the 
few people who actually got paid to do something in open source, they had like an aura around them. You kind of like saddled up to them, hoping that some of it was going to rub off on you. I mean, even the people at Red Hat, you know, which you think, you know, the great and mighty Red Hat, e e even back then, you know, they didn't know whether next quarter the company was going to go under. Uh, Mad Dog Hall, how many people know Mad Dog Hall? The rest of you need to get to know Mad Dog Hall. Mad Dog's been around forever. <coughs> and Mad Dog tells this story of uh, being at one of these early conferences and seeing Bob Young, who is the early chief cook and bottle washer for Red Hat, seeing Bob Young and he's got his staff around him. He pulls out this wad of bills and he starts peeling off bills and giving it to people for expense money to go get food and lodging. And Mad Dog went up to Bob afterwards and said, what, what's with this thing with the, with, the, with the bills? He said, oh, that's the receivables for the company. I have to be careful how we give it out, because otherwise we won't have enough money to get back home. You know, that was where things were. Open source jobs were really, really tentative, because it wasn't the big players. It was just these little mom and pop shops that were trying to stay afloat. So everything was tenuous, and you didn't have stability. You know, today, brass ring achieved. You know, we had the show of hands earlier. We are populated with open source people, uh, professional open source people. I mean, if you go to a Linux Foundation, particularly a Linux Foundation conference, you know, and I ask the question, how many people have an open source job? Every hand in that room is going to go up, except for you know, a couple of PR people or something like this. Open source has got the legitimacy that we hope for. You know, we don't have the scoffers. Even Baradour in Redmond is not as ominous as once. But people have to remember, you know, for younger people, Microsoft was the great Satan once upon a time. Everyone, you know, hated, loathed, was suspicious of what's Microsoft going to do next? Are they going to try to land on us? Are they going to try to destroy us? Ugh. You know, suddenly, these days, people are not talking about what the parent company of Nokia is going to do next. It's a different world. <laughs> so, you know, it seems like we have everything together. But has that brass ring, in some areas, is it turning into brass handcuffs? Some of us have open source jobs that I consider real open source jobs. I've got one. Thank you, Lord. I am Zen Project Evangelist. I get a paycheck from Citrix. What are my goals? My goals are to make sure that Zen Project is healthy, you know, enumerated in various ways. Citrix has a whole bunch of Zen leveraging products, which is wonderful. But if they make money or don't make money, it has nothing to do with, m with me as an individual. I generally like to see them make money because if they make money, they'll hopefully keep sending me a check, which is kind of cool. But other than that, I really have no, you know, I have my own voice. I can actually stand up here and talk about stuff like this. Unfortunately, I have to start asking the question, are we sacrificing our jobs for our empowerment? Some cases yes, some cases no. So I just ask you, you know, ask these questions of yourself. Are you allowed to make your own open source decisions? If you're doing coding, do you have the leeway to commit things to the project that are your ideas and not what the company is paying you to do? Maybe on your own time? Do you kind of contribute the way you want to? Do you have your own voice or are you just a corporate voice? I mean, you go to some of these, these larger conferences, and the first question is, who are you? The next question is, who do you work for? As if that establishes your voice. Well, that wasn't the issue 15 years ago. You get to the question of who you work for at some point. But the question is, the second question was always, what are you working on? What's of interest to you? What project? What are you doing? That was the discussion. Are we becoming, depending on our job, becoming more of that corporate power tool? 
In recent years, you know, as I said, I kind of had to fade off the open source circuit and come back in because of my employment. I've noted what I, what I call fake open source. Fake open source I define as a project that has the right license. It's GPL, it's, maybe it's BSD, I don't know, something. It's open source license. But it was created with a closed source mindset. You had a group of guys working inside a room, putting the code together, they throw it over the wall, slap a license on it, and say it's open source. This came to light to me uh, in the last job I was in when my boss decided we wanted a portal, we wanted an open source portal. It's like, okay, cool. So we went out and we found one that had the right license, everything else seemed to be pretty usable. So we went to hire somebody to come in as a consultant and make it work for us the way we want it. That's when we found out something. We couldn't hire anyone who either didn't work for the company that produced it or didn't used to work for the company that produced it. We found one guy. We ended up having to bring him on board to do it. Only one guy, though, that wasn't in that category of being a current or ex-employee of the organization that put it together. There is something wrong here. The organism which is open source, the people, the community, wasn't there. So there, without, that in, without that community, there is no empowerment. Because you've got a bunch of people sitting in a room doing what they're told. They're being the power tools of someone else. It was just a job. I was at a, uh, uh, the com community, what's it called, Community Leadership Summit, the thing that comes before OSCON last year. And we did a little, you know, it's an unconference, so we had a bunch of people sitting around a table talking about stuff like this. And I asked the question, how many people have open source jobs? And probably, uh, you know, 80% of the people gathered around, raised their hand. And I said, how many people, if those jobs went away tomorrow, would still be involved in open source inside some way, shape, or form, maybe not the same way as today. Some hands went down. Not a lot, but some hands went down. Now, these are the cream of the crop. You folks who come out to a conference like this, you're motivated. You've got something going on in your head. And these people went to that conference, and some of them would have bowed out and gone to work for Microsoft next week and not think anything of it. There's something wrong with that picture because they're missing the heart. So I have to ask the question, is success killing open source? Are we poisoning our own roots by forgetting where we came from? Do we understand the history? You know, one of the things that I really noticed when I was away for a few years and came back into the conference circuit, so many of the people that I knew aren't here. Now, you have to expect that. People come and go and change, and some burn out, and some go on to different jobs. I, I get that. But the thing I also noticed was that when we started to talk about history, the newer people didn't know the history of the older people. They didn't know where we came from. Therefore, they didn't realize that they may be missing something when they came aboard. I heard about a company over in Asia that hired 100 open source developers. Don't know details, but I'd, if I were a betting man, I'd probably bet a week's salary and win. That if we went and we took a look at those people, they were not open source developers. They were people working in a closed source mindset who were dealing and producing code that had the right license on it. They're not empowered. They're not feeling the difference. They're not becoming part of the community in the same way. So uh, this slide's actually old because I'm up to about maybe about 20 conferences in the past year and a half. And this is what I'm seeing. These conferences, I love coming to these regional conferences because the enthusiasm's here. I was in uh, Texas, in Austin last week, Texas Linux Fest. 
another splendid, splendid co uh, conference. Uh, uh, Linux Fest Northwest <coughs> a few weeks back. Again, the enthusiasm, it's great. But we have to make sure that we are telling one another our stories. We have to make sure that the history is not lost with new people. And that we also have to bring out into the fore the knowledge that we are here not just because it's collaboration or what have you, but it's empowering to be here. And I don't hear that statement going on. And as I said before, if the cream of the crop, some hands go down when I say, are you going to be an open source tomorrow if your job goes away? What about the rest of these people? What about the people on your project, if you're, if you're uh, coding? What about the people at your place of work who may be you know, using open source technology? Do they get it? Do they know? Who's going to tell them? My statement is that we are at the point, we're not sitting at the precipice waiting to dive off. I mean, it's not a dire situation. But we can lose our way. And we can lose our way slowly and gradually unless we teach one another. We have to tell other people about the empowering side of open source. We have to tell one another, the new people who come into your project, the new people who come into your place of work, let them know this is not just the same old, same old, that there's something else here. And it's not about going to some course on how to lecture people and getting a really snazzy suit and, uh, you know, and learning how to do PowerPoint, you know, that, that crap. It's about letting what's in here out. You know, I see it when we walk through the halls and I see people talking with one another. The enthusiasm's there. We just have to make sure that we're sharing that. And we're saying, this means something. This means something to me. And the more you, s you can share your own story with other people, the more power there is in the room. So the assignment that I'm asking you to undertake is this. Go ahead and tell people what you know. Who can tell your story better than you? Have you come to some sort of knowledge in your own dealings with things, a, a, a sense of liberation, a sense of, of empowerment, maybe economic, maybe, maybe personal, maybe it's just you know, the thrill of getting some code out there and people are using it and they're saying, that's really cool. That's something. Or maybe it's some getting up and standing in front of other, learning that you can stand up in front of other people. I mean, this is rocket science compared to where we thought we, what we thought we could do 30 years ago. People would just be horrified with the notion of a geek getting up and talking. And yet, this, you know, this, this long weekend has proved time and time again, it's very, very possible. We can do this because we have a voice and we have a value. Passion trumps PowerPoint any day. You know, I remember back just after the Earth's surface cooled and I got out of college, <laughs> uh, the vice president of the little software company I was working with back then was talking to me and, he, and you know, I was doing development at the time. And he said, Russ, when you show me the new feature for the new version of our software, I want you to convince me that this is the best thing. I want to know when I go into my selling situation that I'm going to be doing the customer a disfavor if I allow him to buy the other guy's stuff because ours is better. Why? Because when I go in there and I'm convinced there's going to be a look in my eye and a sound in my voice that says I'm telling the truth, and the truth is powerful. And that's one of the great things about this movement. We've got truth with us. We're not lying to one another. 
We're not selling one another. We're talking to one another and sharing what we know to be true. There's power in that. We cannot discount that. That will beat the PowerPoint people any day. So if you know something, share it, talk about it. Be enthusiastic about it. Leak all over people. You know, how many people have been to maybe some sort of, you know, uh, standard closed source software conference? And the fella, and it's usually a fella, stands up in front of the room and he's wearing a suit that is more expensive than my car. And he says, look what I have wrought. See the magnificent things that I have brought about through my marvelous mind and the nameless minions behind me. See how wonderful. Stand, applaud, applaud, applaud me. We, we're used to that. If you've been in this industry for a while, you're used to that. But in the open source world, it's not the guy or the gal standing up here that matters. It's you. So open source is all about participation. I want you all to stand up. If you've got legs that work, stand up for a second. Now, you're all doing dutifully looking at the guy up front. Don't. I want you to turn around and look at any other group of people in the room, individual people. I'm going to stand and stare at this fellow over here. OK? You're looking at somebody. You know what you're looking at? You're looking at the reason why you're here. You're looking at an open source person who's using it, they're learning about it, maybe they're developing it, who knows? But they're part of us. They're the reason why we're here. So give them a hand. Okay, you can be seated. So that's it. I just wanted to thank you all for coming out on a Sunday morning, <laughs> first off. Um, but that's the essence of, of what concerns me. This is not, some, as I said before, you know, I've, had, I've talk, given this talk and people say, oh, you know, you're just being doom and gloom and, you know, it's not that bad. Well, it's not that bad yet. But if you've got a cancer, the time to get rid of that cancer is when it's this big rather than when it's this big. And the thing is, there is this big out there. There are those jobs out there that are taking our voices and we're not talking about it. We're not thinking about it. So the more we talk about it and think about it and tell others what this all means to us, the more likely it is that we can get that out of here and keep it from being a problem in a bigger sense. Questions? Good morning. Um I just wanted to ask, how does open source, free open source, or, or open source, protect the efforts of people? Let's say if corporations make use of it in some type of commercial uh, development project and, and present it to the public, maybe just a little bit more elaborate. So as far as like a lot of software, they have licenses and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I can see where all this activity is absorbed into a more elaborate commercial product. Mm -hmm. So is there protection there in the open source world for what people do? Well, uh, I don't know exactly what you mean by protection, except that if you mean protection in terms of uh, giving credit where credit is due, let's start with that. Uh, the good thing about most free and open source license, particularly like the GPL, uh, says that you have to open up the code so that the code is there and the names are attached to the code or whatever means that project operates. So that published part is out there. The other thing is that, you know, like in a company like Citrix, where, where, uh, that, that pays me, they have a number of products that leverage the Zen Project Hypervisor as part of their product set. And they're free to go out and you know, make money with that, and that's fine. But they can't hide the fact that it's still leveraging what we do and who we are. They can't say, no, 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 you can't do this or that. That's for us to decide as project members. Um, so, I mean, we have our autonomy. Others can come along and use it, and there's nothing wrong with others, other people using it. And we consider that a sign of success, generally, that you want to be solving someone's problem. 
And whether it's a person, whether it's a mom and pop shop, or whether it's a multinational corporation, if we're solving their problem, that's good. We've done something worthwhile. Hopefully someone's getting value. But the big thing is we have to make sure, and we do this generally through licensing and through our governance, that we are not forgotten and we are not cast over. And the licensing, particularly inside most free and open source licenses, require a, a level of acknowledgement or at least an inability to cover up who we are and what we've done. And we still have, you know, like I said, even though uh, Citrix has products that use Zen Project, if you want to use Zen Project, go ahead. And you're not going to spend a dollar, you know, other than download time or whatever else you, you want. And that's the way it is with everything uh, in this community. It's there, and if someone wants to roll it together and put a bow on it and, uh, you know, add a little special sauce to the top, well, that's, that's their business, and they want to charge a, you know, some money for it, whatever. But we don't have to. Um, I remember uh, more, more than once I've talked with people who are, who are trying to start up you know, small organizations or a small company or something, a mom and pop type organization. They said, yeah, well, we got a PC, but we need an office software, and that costs more than the PC does. They said, well, you know, open office, Libre office. These things you can just download and go. And they're even, for the most part, compatible with the stuff that you're used to using. It's like, wow. And that's, that's where we can make the huge difference on that micro level where we can enable individuals. And you know, that's frequently what we talk about when we talk about the value of open source. And that is, that's a tremendous value that we're giving to people who don't have the opportunity. We're giving them opportunity. But at the macro level, we're also getting op opportunity by doing what we're doing. And so that's part of my concern. Does that answer your question? Any other questions or comments? Spitballs. Flaming bricks thrown through my window. Hey, Russell. This is uh, Ben Francis from Fosperts. Uh, and my question is, um, to what extent is the uh, whole revelations of uh, NSA mass surveillance of, uh, of companies and, uh, and companies that don't want to play just get, uh, get shut down like LavaBit did, uh, what extent is that going to push open source into, um, you know, breathe new life into the open source movement in, in government and uh, commercial entities? Okay. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, most people heard about you know the revelations last year of uh, the NSA reportedly uh, tapping Angela Merkel's phone, the Chancellor of Germany. I happened to be in Europe when that broke. Oh my God, the difference in the coverage over there as opposed to over here. I mean, I I was uh, I remember uh, sending messages to my wife. I said, what, what what's the coverage like at home about this story? And uh, I got a text back and I said, well, I've been watching the morning news for 25 minutes. And finally, they did a 45 second segment on it after spending eight minutes about whether Brett Favre suffered a concussion that you know, was going to you know, uh, do nastiness to his life or something like that. It's like, what? <laughs> Over in Europe, you had people breathing fire. Literally, I was at a conference and people were pissed. And rightfully so. And one of the things that I think is probably not as prevalent here as it is in parts other than here is that you had an immense wave that was going through people saying, no longer can we, be, uh, can we rely on the output of a country that may not have our best interest in heart. And the way that rolls out is open source is better because we can look into the code and determine if there's something sneaky in there. And if there is, we can fix it. Whereas the Microsoft desktop, the Apple, et cetera, et cetera, these closed devices that happen to come from the US of A, who knows what's underneath them? We don't. So I think 
when you get, when you get out of the confines of, of our country, it is very much in the minds of people that open source is a much safer way to go. Um, I think it was what it was the, the keynote, morning keynote yesterday where the gentleman was talking about various things that relate to this and you could go down a long rabbit trail uh, saying that uh, there is, there should be more concern here than there is about some of the things that have gone on, absolutely. But, um, but once you cross the national boundary, it's absolutely clear that open source is a preferred model for just about anything. A follow-up to that. Weren't they well aware that their own country is doing that? Was there any talk about that while you were over there? Because a lot of European countries do the same thing, not that any of it's good. Yeah, I, I, I think there is some knowledge of it. It's, you know, once again, that was not the issue of the, of the morning. But, but once again, especially inside, uh, let's take Europe, you've got this conglomeration of nations that are supposedly working together, but at the same time, you know, they're, they're staring at each other's back doors like, you know, what are you, what, what are you doing? You know, that sort of thing. So once again, open source makes perfect sense for them as well. Because rather than, they can't do it all themselves. So the best thing to do it is that open collaboration, which everyone talks about in the open source world, where you can look at the stuff and you decide, and if you find something that's you know, wonky, pull it out and replace it with something. So, um, so whether, whether we, you know, I don't want to get saddled too much on the NSA specifically, but I think the sense out there in the greater world is open source makes sense. Open source makes more sense in this world and where we, we live where there is sneakiness and danger than trusting a black box that you got from parts unknown or from the other guy, whoever the other guy is. Questions, comments? Well, once again, thank you very much for showing up on a Sunday morning. I appreciate it. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.